During this last lecture of the series, I propose to say, however rash it may seem, what it is that the heart of Romanticism appears to me to be. I should like to go back again to a theme which I spoke of in the first and second lectures on this topic, namely the old tradition which is at the heart of all Western thought for at least 2,000 years and more before the middle of the 18th century. That particular attitude, those particular beliefs, which it appears to me Romanticism attacked and gravely damaged, namely the old proposition that virtue is knowledge, a proposition which is was enunciated, I suppose, for the first time explicitly by Socrates in the pages of Plato and which is common to him and to the Christian tradition. What kind of knowledge one may disagree about? One, the, the, there are battles between one philosopher and another, one religion and another, one scientist and another, between religion and science, between religion and art, between every kind of attitude and every kind of school of thought and every other. But the battle is invariably about what is that true knowledge of reality, the possession of which makes it possible for men to know what to do, how to fit in. The proposition that there is a nature of things such that if you know this nature and know yourself in relation to this nature, and if there is a divinity, if you know this divinity and understand the relationships between everything that composes the universe, then your goals as well as the facts about yourself must become clear to you and you understand what it is that you should do if you are to fulfill yourself in the manner in which your nature cries out for. And for this it is necessary to know whether the knowledge is a knowledge of physics or psychology or theology or some intuitive kind of knowledge, individual or public, whether it is confined to experts or maybe known by every man about all these things disagreement may occur. But that there is such a knowledge, that is the foundation of the entire Western tradition, which, as I say, Romanticism attacked. This is the view of the jigsaw puzzle, of which we must fit in the fragments. That is the view of the secret treasure which we must seek. The essence of this view is there is a body of facts to which we must submit. Science is submission. Science is being guided by the nature of things. Scrupulous regard for what there is. Non-deviation from the nature of things understanding, knowledge, adapt adaptation. The opposite of this, which is, I think, what the Romantic movement proclaimed, may be summarized under two heads. One, which will be familiar to you from these lectures, is the notion of the indomitable will. Not knowledge of values, but that creation is what men do. You create values, you create goals, you create ends, and in the end, you create your own vision of the universe, exactly as artists create works of art. And before the artist has created the work of art, it doesn't exist. It isn't anywhere. There is no copying, there is no adaptation, there is no learning of the rules, there is no external check, so to speak. There is no structure which you must understand and adapt yourself to before you can proceed. The heart of the entire process is invention, creation, making out of literally nothing or out of any materials that may be to hand. And the most central aspect of this view is, of course, that your universe is as you choose to make it, to some degree at any rate. That is the philosophy of Fichte, that is to some extent the philosophy of Schelling, that is the insight indeed in our own day, even of such psychologists as Freud, who maintain that the universe of people um, um, possessed by one set of will illusions or possessed by another set of fantasies, it will be different from those possessed by another. The second proposition is that there is no, and it really is in some sense connected with the first, is that there is no structure of things. There is no pattern to which you must adapt yourself. There is only, if not the flow, the endless self-creativity of the universe. The universe must be conceived of not as a set of facts, not as a pattern of events, not as a collection of lumps in space, three-dimensional entities bound together by certain unbreakable relations as, for example, taught to us by, say, physics, chemistry and other natural sciences, the universe is a process of perpetual forward self-thrusting, perpetual self-creation, which can either be conceived of as hostile to man, as, say, by Schopenhauer, or even to some extent by Nietzsche, which will overthrow all human efforts to trick it, to organize it, to f feel at home in it, to, to make oneself a, some kind of cozy uh, pattern in which one can rest. Either that, or friendly, because you can, ad by identifying yourself with it, by creating with it, by throwing yourself into this great process, 
Indeed, by discovering in yourself those very creative forces which you also discover outside, by identifying, on the one hand, spirit, on the other hand, matter, by seeing the whole thing as a vast self-organizing and self-creative process, by doing this, you will at, at last be free. Understanding is not the proper term to use, because understanding throughout presupposes the understander and the understood, the knower and the known, some kind of gap between the subject and the object. But here, there is no object. There is only the subject, in some sense, create, thrusting itself forward. The subject may be the universe, the subject may be the individual, the subject may be the class, the nation, the church, whatever may, is identified as the truest reality, so to speak, in, um, of, of which the universe consists. But in any case, it is, as I say, a process of perpetual forward creation. And all schemas, all generalizations, all patterns put upon it are forms of distortion, are forms of breaking. When Wordsworth said that to dissect is to murder, this is approximately what he meant. And he was much the mildest of those who expressed this particular point of view. To ignore this, to evade it, to attempt to see these things as in some sense submissive to some kind of intellectualization, some sort of plan, that to attempt to draw up a set of rules or a set of laws or a formula and so forth is a form of self-indulgence or, and in the end, suicidal stupidity. That, at any rate, is the sermon of the Romantics. Wherever you try and understand anything by whatever powers you have, you will discover, as I tried to say last time, you will discover that what you are pursuing, to, what you are pursuing is inexhaustible, that you are trying to catch the uncatchable, that you are trying to apply a formula to something which evades your formula, because wherever you try and nail it down, new abysses open, and these abysses open to yet other abysses. The only persons who have ever made sense of reality are those who understand that to try and circumscribe these things, to try and nail them down, to try and describe them, no matter how scrupulously, is a vain task. And this will be true not only of science, which of course does this by means of the most rigorous generalizations of to the romantics, the most external and empty kind, but even those scrupulous writers, those scrupulous describers of experience, realists, naturalists, those who, those who belong to the school of um, the flow of consciousness, Proust, Tolstoy, the most gifted diviners of every movement of the human spirit, even those to the extent to which they commit themselves to some kind of objective description, whether by external inspection or the most subtle introspection, the most subtle insight into the inner movements of the spirit, so long as they labor under the illusion that it is possible once and for all to write down, to describe, to give any finality to the, the, the process which they are trying to catch, which they are trying to nail down, so long as this goes on, unreality will result, fantasy will result. Some attempt always to cage the uncageable, so to speak. Some attempt always to pursue some kind of truth where there is no truth, to try and stop the unceasing flow, to catch movement by means of rest, to catch time by means of space, to catch light by means of darkness. That is the romantic sermon. And when they ask themselves, how then one could begin to understand reality in some sense of the word understanding, how one might obtain some kind of insight into this without positively distinguishing oneself on the one hand as a subject and distinguishing it as an object without in the process killing it. The answer which they sought to give, at least some of them, was that the only way of doing this was by means of myths, by means of these symbols which I tried to speak last time, because myths embody within themselves something inarticulable and also somehow managed to encapsulate the dark, the irrational, the inexpressible, that which in some way conveys the deep darkness of this whole process by images which themselves carry you to further images and which themselves point in some infinite direction. That is, at any rate, what the Germans, who I think are responsible for the, this, this whole outlook in the end, uh, preached. The Greeks, for them, understood life because Apollo and Dionysus were symbols, they were myths, who at one and the same time conveyed certain properties, and yet if you ask yourself what it is that Apollo stands for, what it is that Dionysus wants, the attempt to spell this out in a finite number of words, or even paint a finite number of pictures, was plainly an absurdity. And therefore, in some sense, myths are at one and the same time images which the mind can contemplate in relative tranquility, and yet also something which is everlasting, follows each generation, transforms itself in the transformation of men, and is it's in some sense an inexhaustible supply of the relevant images which are at once static and eternal. But these images, the Greek images, are dead for us, for we are not Greeks. 
that much harder at autumn. The notion of returning to Dionysus or returning to Odin is absurd. Therefore, we must have modern myths. Therefore, and since there are no modern myths because science has killed them, or at any rate has made uh, the atmosphere unpropitious to them, we must create them. And so there is a conscious process of myth-making. And we get, in the early 19th century, all this conscientious and painful effort to construct myths, perhaps not so painful, perhaps some of it could be described as pergenius, the effort to construct myths which shall serve us in the way in which the old myths served the Greeks. The roots of life are lost in darkness, said um, Wilhelm Schlegel. Um, the magic of life rests on insoluble mystery, and this is what the myths must somehow incorporate. The romantic art, said his brother Friedrich, is a perpetual becoming without ever attaining of perfection. Nothing can plumb its depths. It alone is infinite, alone free. Its first law is the, will of the is the will of the Creator, the will of the Creator that knows no law. All art is an attempt to evoke by symbols the inexpressible vision of the unceasing activity which is life. This is what I have attempted to convey. Now, that is how Hamlet, for example, becomes a myth. That is how Don Quixote becomes a myth. That is how Faust becomes a myth. What Shakespeare would have said about the extraordinary literature which has accumulated around Hamlet, what Cervantes would have said about the extraordinary um, adventures which Don Quixote has had from the early 19th century onwards, I don't know. But at any rate, these things were converted into rich sources of mythology, and, and if their inventors knew nothing about it, so much the better. The assumption was the author cannot know what dark depths he plumbs. Mozart cannot tell what genius it is that inspires him. Indeed, so far as he can tell, his genius probably to that extent dries up. And that, I think, if you wish for, for a very vivid illustration of the mismaking capacity of the early 19th century, which is really the heart of the Romantic movement, the attempt so to, speak, to break reality into fragments, to get away from uh, the structure of things, uh, to say the unsayable and so on, the history of the opera Don Giovanni, of most of Don Giovanni, is quite an apt illustration. As everyone who has heard it knows, the, the opera ends, or almost ends, with the destruction of Don Giovanni by uh, the uh, infernal forces, after he fails to reform, after he fails to repent, thunder is heard and he is swallowed up uh, by the forces of hell. At the end of which, after he has been swallowed up and the smoke on the stage is cleared, there is a success on the part of the remaining characters in the drama, who then think a, a, a very pretty little sextet about um, how splendid it is that Don Giovanni has been destroyed while they are alive and happy and propose to seek a perfectly peaceful and contented and ordinary life, in each in his own fashion. Mazzetto is going to marry Zerlina, Elvira will go back to her convent, Leporello will find a new master, Ottavio will marry Don Anna, and so on. In the 19th century, this perfectly harmless sextet, was one of the most charming of Mozart's pieces, was regarded by the public as blasphemous and was therefore never performed. It was first reintroduced into the European repertory, so far as I know, by Mahler towards the end of the 19th or beginning of the 20th century and is now regularly played. The reason is this. Here is this vast and dominating, sinister, symbolic figure, Don Giovanni, who stands, we, don't, we know not for what, but certainly for something inexpressible. He stands perhaps for art as against life. He stands perhaps for some principle of inexhaustible evil against some kind of Philistine good. He stands for power, he stands for magic, he stands for some kind of infernal forces of a superhuman kind. And the, 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 the opera ends with an enormous climax in which one infernal force is swallowed by another, and this vast melodrama rises to a volcanic climax which is meant to cow the audience and show them amidst what and, 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 and unstable and what a terrifying world they live. And then suddenly this Philistine little piece, this sextet which follows, in which the characters simply peacefully think about the fact that uh, a rake has been punished and good men will continue their life, their ordinary, perfectly peaceful lives thereafter. This was regarded as inartistic, shallow, pathetic and disgusting, and therefore eliminated. Now, this elevation of Don Giovanni into a vast myth which dominates over us, which must somehow be interpreted in a way um, to convey some kind of the profoundest and the most inexpressible aspects of the terrifying nature of reality was certainly very far from the thoughts of the librettist, and probably very far from the thoughts of Mozart. The librettist, Lorenzo da Ponte, who started life um, as, as, as a converted Jew in Venice and ended it, I think, as a music teacher in Philadelphia, was certainly very remote from any thought of b b b b placing upon the stage one of the great, one of the vast symbols of spiritual existence on earth. But in the 19th century, this was the attitude taken towards Don Giovanni, and he continued to haunt the minds of the 19th century, he haunted Kierkegaard's mind to a very profound degree, and he haunted the minds of the 19th century, and, and indeed does so to the present, until the present day. 
This is a very, very typical example of the total reversal of values, of the complete transformation of something which started off by being dry, classical, symmetrical, and in every respect, in accordance with the conventions of the age, it was something which has burst its frame and suddenly begins to spread its wings in the most unaccustomed and, 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 and fearful fashion.